Hello, Hi Guru family. Hope you all are doing well and staying safe in these tough times. If you're new, my name is Rahul. I'm a pediatric critical care fellow, and I've been absolutely passionate about helping students kick ass on their USMLE. Today is actually going to be a very unique video, and it is going to focus on a strategic approach on how to go through vital signs on the USMLE. Now, just as a little bit of a background for you, about 75% of vignettes on the USMLE are going to have a clinical scenario. And out of that, there are many test questions, both on step one and step two, that are actually going to have vital signs for you to interpret. Now, the short of all of this, guys, is going to be quantitative to qualitative, but I'm going to be going through a very high yield table, and that table I actually did attach to the description so that you can follow along with this lecture. What we'll first do is start with the question. A 50-year-old man presents with chills and fatigue 10 weeks after a cadaveric renal transplant. There is no rash. He is on tacrolimus, steroids, and TMP SMX. His vital signs are the following. Temperature, 39. Heart rate, 120. Respiratory rate, 35. Blood pressure, 100 over 80. Physical exam is notable for capillary refill less than two seconds, warm extremities, and two plus pulses. 48 hours after presentation, his blood culture grows gram-negative bacillus that is oxidase positive. What is the likely mechanism related to this patient's acute presentation? A. Activation of endothelin and increased RV strain. B. Acute T-cell mediated reaction to grafted kidney transplant. C. Cessation of steroids leading to adrenal crisis. D. Lipid A mediated increase in acute phase cytokines, or E, decreased systemic vascular resistance due to pseudomonal exotoxin secretion. This is a very unique question, and stay tuned to the end of the video as we will go through the answer and the explanation. But I'll give you a couple seconds right now to try to figure out what you think the answer is. All right, let's move on. So when we're talking about vital signs in test questions, what you really have to keep in mind is that a vital sign is a number. And to me, I take that number as a piece of quantitative data. And for you, as you're going through your USMLE questions, what you have to do, especially for vital signs and labs, you have to turn that quantitative data into qualitative assessments. So for example, when we're looking at that last question right there, that question stated that there was a temperature of 39 degrees centigrade. Well, rather than kind of fixing that as 39 degrees, I would definitely encourage you to say, hey, the patient is febrile. Quantitative data needs to be turned into qualitative assessments. So what we'll do is go through every single vital sign you will see on the USMLE and I'll give you the highest yield scenarios that I think you'll get tested on. Now, remember, this is not a all comprehensive list, but I think these are the ones that I have seen through practice questions, through um, tutoring with students, etc. I think these are the highest yield for you as you go through your exam. Now, what we need to do is we need to look at the extremes, i.e., for example, for temperature, we're going to go through hyperthermia and hypothermia. For example, for heart rate, tight tachycardia, excuse me, and bradycardia, et cetera, et cetera. The first one we'll start with is going to be temperature. So when we're thinking about temperature, let's just go through normal. Normal temperature usually is going to be about 36 to 37.5 centigrade. And for the USMLE, you really need to recognize what constitutes as hyperthermia, and that's usually going to be a temperature greater than or equal to 38. And so when I see hyperthermia on the USMLE, the causes that I think of are going to be rooted in this mental model. And what I tell myself is when I see a fever in a vital sign, this is either an infectious 
or inflammatory pathology. And let's go into that just a little bit more. So when you're thinking about hyperthermia, which is going to be one extreme of temperature, U.S. Assembly questions are usually going to be related to, like I mentioned, an infectious etiology. So think about things like bacterial infections, viral infections, fungal infections. And one of the key points to characterize in the test question is to look at what kind of host you are dealing with. So for example, going back to our test question, we looked at the cadaveric renal transplant patient who is on what? Tacrolimus and steroids. The, this patient is actually what we call an immunocompromised host due to his transplant status and the immunosuppressive drugs he's taking. The other thing that I want you to notice for test questions that relate to hyperthermia is look for the source of infection. Is it a pneumonia? Is it going to be a UTI? Is it going to be, for example, a septic joint? These are really important kind of clues to hone in on in your exam. The other element of hyperthermia that you got to keep in mind for exam questions is the inflammatory conditions. So things like rheumatological diseases, that's going to be channeling you into various etiologies like, hey, could this be lupus? Could this, for example, be rheumatoid arthritis? Any type 3 hypersensitivity reaction can cause you to have antigen antibody complex uh, reactions within certain tissues, and thus you can get a fever. So this is your exam question on like serum sickness, for example, where somebody takes a medication or um, some sort of trigger that acts as a haptin, and then a week or more later, they're going to get the joint pain and then the uh, fevers. And then the other thing to think about are vasculitity. So any sort of inflammation of the vessels. So things like microscopic polyangiitis, polyarthritis nodosa, et cetera, et cetera. So the key take home point guys is in test questions, hyperthermia equals infectious or inflammatory conditions. Now, another minor mechanism for hyperthermia, and this is always tested on the USMLE are pharmacologically related illnesses. So things like your aspirin overdose. Remember key points for aspirin overdose is that it is sometimes going to be used as an antipyretic in children and unfortunately can cause Ray syndrome. So watch for that presentation. The other thing for aspirin overdose, you got to understand is that it causes you to have a respiratory alkalosis with also a concurrent metabolic acidosis that has an anion gap. The other ones are that you're going to see for hyperthermia in terms of toxicity is anticholinergic toxicity. So think about your atropine patient that is going to be uh, mad as a hatter, hot as a hair type of thing. Neuroleptic malignant syndrome. This is going to be if somebody takes, for example, haloperidol and they end up getting that very kind of lead pipe rigidity. And then the malignant hyperthermia, you can still get some element of hypertonic state. And remember that in the operating room, these patients are going to have an increase in their CO2 as a very early sign. So think about these causes for hyperthermia. And these are just some really important vignettes to keep in mind. Now, when we think about hypothermia, US Assembly questions are usually going to be related to patients who are unable to mount a response. So those are your immunocompromised hosts. So a classic example is neonatal sepsis. So you'll see a two day old who presents with lethargy, poor feeding, and they have a lower temperature. This is something where you have to recognize that yes, they have hypothermia, but they still may have an infection. Say that you have a patient on your exam that has some sort of brain trauma or some sort of tumor that is causing you to have impaired central regulation of temperature. So this is where I want to just give a little bit of a neuroanatomy tie in and answer this question. What portion of the hypothalamus controls temperature? And the answer here is the anterior and posterior hypothalamus. Now, remember that the anterior hypothalamus is involved in releasing heat, i.e. cooling you. And so a lesion of the anterior hypothalamus can cause you to have hyperthermia. Whereas the posterior hypothalamus does the exact opposite. It's actually involved in conserving heat and a lesion could cause you to have hypothermia. Other causes of hypothermia, not as high yield, but worth mentioning, 
things like hypothyroidism, environmental conditions. So think about like a patient who was uh, submerged in an ice bath or uh, was in like a lake that was really, really cold. And then also decreased fat due to malnutrition. Basically here, you don't have the shivering mechanism to warm your body back up or regulate your temperature. And so that could be a theoretical cause for hypothermia. All right. So I think by this point of the lecture, you're like, whoa, this is a little bit like integrative. I'm talking a lot more about strategy and recognition because we will see this in the end. My goal is to really help you think like the test maker. So the next concept we're going to be going into in terms of this strategic approach to vital sign interpretation is going to be heart rate interpretation. So when we're thinking about heart rate, remember that in adult, normally you're talking about a heart rate between 60 to 100. Pediatric patients, they can vary. However, think about a range in pediatric patients as being a little bit higher and anything above 160 on your exam should kind of clue you in on some pathologies that we'll be talking about. So let's start with one of the extremes and that's a high heart rate. Again, you want to look at a heart rate on the USMLE in your test question and then you want to say, bam, that is high, i.e. tachycardia. So what are the different causes of tachycardia? Well, one of them is going to be anemia. Anemia is going to be a very subtle but important cause of tachycardia. And the pathophysiologic mechanism is absolutely beautiful. So remember, anemia is going to be a decrease in hemoglobin. And when you have a decrease in hemoglobin, you have a decrease in arterial oxygen content. Now, remember that arterial oxygen content is only one portion of the equation when you're talking about oxygen delivery to the tissues. So let's relate these concepts. Remember that oxygen delivery to the tissues is arterial oxygen content times cardiac output. And so when you have a decreased arterial oxygen content, you are going to have a decrease in delivery of oxygen. Remember that cardiac output is going to be heart rate times stroke volume. And so in order for you to compensate for your decreased arterial oxygen content due to the anemia, i.e. the low hemoglobin, you are going to have a compensatory increase in heart rate. And so remember guys, USMLE step one, especially now is very mechanism focused. And I would encourage you that as you study, you should really try to delve into a little bit. What are the different mechanisms at play? Now, hypovolemia can also cause you to have tachycardia. Remember that this is usually going to be triggered by low effective perfusion to the kidney, but recognize that when you have a hypovolemic state, you have decreased afferent baroreceptor firing. So remember, baroreceptors are actually going to respond to stretch. And so what happens is that when you have decreased stretch due to hypovolemia, you get an increased efferent sympathetic outflow, and that causes you to increase your heart rate. Now, what about arrhythmia? Arrhythmia is unique because on your exams, usually arrhythmia is going to have a very high heart rate. Now, in bradycardia, we'll talk about heart block, but usually the most common arrhythmia they'll test you on are going to be things like atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, and especially supraventricular tachycardia. Now, to recognize this in your exam questions, arrhythmias are usually going to have a very fast heart rate around 160 to 180. What's important for us to recognize in exam questions is that they can put a multimedia type of EKG image for you to interpret in which, for example, an AFib, they're not going to have discernible P waves or for a flutter, they're going to have the sawtooth appearance. But long story short, when they test you on supraventricular tachycardia, they will likely put it in the context of Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. Remember that in Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, you have an accessory bundle of Kent pathway that's causing you to have premature ventricular depolarization, and thus you're going to get that upstroke of your uh, QRS complex. So with supraventricular tachycardia, think about the high heart rate, the narrow QRS complex, and most importantly, they love for you to note that vagal maneuvers has a very nice pathophysiologic mechanism. And that's actually the opposite of what we talked about in the hypovolemic state pathophysiologic mechanism. Remember that with vagal maneuvers, as you are going to palpate the carotid, 
you are going to have an increase in baroreceptor stretch and thus a increase in parasympathetic outflow via the vagus nerve and subsequently slowing down your heart rate. And now this last one for us to know is hyperthyroidism. Hyperthyroidism, very important cause of high heart rate on your USMLE. So think about anemia, dehydration, arrhythmias, and hyperthyroidism. And I think that that will encompass many of the questions. So now what we'll do is we'll go into the other extreme, and that is going to be bradycardia. Now, when we're talking about bradycardia, I like to think of it as high vagal tone causing bradycardia, at least one of the causes. Remember that the vagus nerve is going to be intimately connected to your SA and AV node, such that if the vagus nerve is going to fire and release that acetylcholine packet at SA or AV node, you are going to get some element of bradycardia. Now, bradycardia can be actually caused by increased baroreceptor activation. And we just talked about this with vagal maneuvers, but remember this reflex bradycardia due to hypertension, that is usually tested in many, exam, um, in many uh, NBME exams. And the mechanism here is, again, like I explained, hypertension causes high carotid stretch, you get increased afferent signal to the brain of the baroreceptor, and subsequently the efferent signal is going to be an increased response and thus decreasing your heart rate. The arrhythmias that cause bradycardia are things like heart block. So on exams, look for grouped beatings of QRS complexes on your EKG to kind of hone in on whether or not this is, uh, for example, a type 2 uh, heart block. And hypothyroidism can even cause you to have bradycardia. Now, one of the highest yield ingestions that you are going to see that cause bradycardia are things like calcium channel blockers as well as beta blockers. So remember calcium channel blockers, specifically your non-dihydropyridine calcium channels. Which ones are those? Verapamil and diltiazem, exactly. The ones that don't act on the vessels as much. Those can definitely cause you to have bradycardia along with beta blockers. Remember, both types of beta blockers, they end in olol, but bismolol, esmolol, atenolol, and metoprolol, B-E-A-M, those are going to be beta-1 specific blockers, and those can actually cause you to have bradycardia in especially an ingestion state. The other one that is not pictured on this slide that I want you to write down is going to be the reflexive bradycardia you get with Cushing's triad. Remember, patients who have traumatic brain injuries in your test questions or have a tumor in which they, on physical exam, have papilledema or any signs of increased intracranial pressure, those patients can have bradycardia as well. All right, let's move on. We have two more vital signs left respiratory rate, and we're going to also talk about blood pressure. So what we'll first do is go through causes of tachypnea. And before we do that, let's talk a little bit about normal for respiratory rate. So typically normal is anywhere around 12 to 20. And again, pediatrics can vary. But if you see a respiratory rate greater than 60, that definitely is something to clue in on. So when we think about tachypnea, I like to group it like this. Number one, you can have primary lung parenchymal issues. So if your lungs are going to be kind of messed up, you are going to start breathing fast. So things like pulmonary fibrosis, pneumonia, or lower respiratory tract infections. Think about your child who comes in with bronchiolitis, or think about a patient who is going to have fever, a focal lung finding, tachypnea, and that's what you're going to be thinking of with pneumonia. Obstructive or restrictive lung diseases can cause tachypnea, but one important one for your exams, guys, is asthma. And so clue in in the test question about atopy or atopic features, such as high IgE or asthma, eczema, allergies. These are things for you to say, ooh, this tachypnea may be due to an asthma attack, especially if you hear wheezing on exam. The other element is going to be something very unique, and that is going to be compensation from metabolic acidosis that can cause tachypnea. Now, let's just go into some active recall here. So with metabolic acidosis, what kind of lab abnormalities will you see? And that's going to be a low pH and a low bicarb. 
Now, what organ helps us with compensation? And that is going to be your lungs. So remember that a metabolic acidosis has a low pH and a low bicarb. And in order for us to get rid of that acid, you are going to need to think of what? Exactly, hyperventilating to get rid of the acid in the form of CO2. Now, another very important cause of tachypnea for you to know for your exam is going to be, you got it, PE, a pulmonary embolism in which you have a blockage of the pulmonary artery or the downstream pulmonary capillaries can cause you to have tachypnea. Anytime on the USMLE exam, I see some stigmata of hypercoagulability and subsequently the patient has tachycardia and tachypnea, I'm definitely going to be thinking of a PE. So just keep that in mind. And remember, you get hypoxemia due to what mechanism? That's it. VQ mismatch. All right. Let's talk a little bit about bradypnea. So when you're thinking about bradypnea, bradypnea is essentially a low respiratory rate. And remember that CNS depressants are always going to be tested. Things like barbiturates, which increase the duration of the GABA channel opening. Things like benzodiazepines. What's the mechanism of action? It increases the frequency of GABA channel opening. Things like opioids are going to be mu receptor agonists. And subsequently, what they are going to do is cause a hypoventilation. Just because we integrated some acid-base stuff earlier on in this lecture, what kind of acid-base abnormality would a patient with opioid overdose have? And if you said respiratory acidosis, you would be absolutely correct. So something important for us to recognize is that when you have respiratory acidosis, especially due to hypoventilation, you are going to end up getting hypoxemia. But what kind of hypoxemia is this? Well, this is the hypoxemia, excuse me, that is not going to increase your AA gradient. Very important for you to know. All right, guys, our last vital sign is going to be blood pressure. Now, for the USMLE, a normal blood pressure, even in clinical practice, is typically in adults 90 to 120 over 60 to 80 diastolic. On the USMLE, I do want to let you know, don't get into the nuances with the numbers. The USMLE really makes vital sign quantities very easy to interpret qualitatively. I.e., if you see a systolic blood pressure less than 90, you should think about hypotension. In pediatrics, the one nuance that I want to let you know is that the blood pressure depends on various body parameters like height. So the USMLA doesn't necessarily go in too much into discerning hyper hypotension. And you'll see other things in the vignette that will kind of help clue you in to any hemodynamic instability a pediatric patient may have. What you may also see and need to interpret on the USMLA is the mean arterial pressure. Generally, a MAP less than 60 is going to be considered hypotension and a MAP greater than 90 is going to be considered hypertension. So let's go through the causes of hypotension that you'll see on your exam. Some of the most important mechanisms at play are going to be things like dehydration, where you have decreased intravascular volume. Hypovolemia due to, for example, diarrhea or vomiting or acute blood loss, all of this can cause you to have a depletion in your intravascular volume. Mineralocorticoid deficiency is very heavily tested. And this can be in an extreme form, for example, in Waterhouse Friedrichsen, secondary to Neisseria meningitidis, or due to an autoimmune etiology, like, as, like such as um, Addison's disease, in which you have increased upstream POMC, and so you have salt wasting, hypotension, as well as hyperpigmentation. That's important uh, test vignette to keep in mind. The other important cause of hypotension that is frequently tested are things like congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Remember, these patients, especially if they have 21 hydroxylase deficiency, they are going to have virilization in your vignette as well as hypotension and hyperkalemia. Other etiologies of hypotension are things like cardiogenic etiologies. So watch, for example, your triad with cardiac tamponade, which is going to be 
distant heart sounds, you're going to have hypotension, and you are going to have JVD, which represents the heart essentially not being able to fill. Heart failure definitely can cause you to have hypotension because a failing heart can thus not pump blood forward and subsequently you get hypotension. Another important cause of hypotension is going to be vasoplegia. And when you're thinking about vasoplegia, think about etiologies such as sepsis, which is going to be due to increased amounts of cytokines that causes you to have vasodilation and thus decrease your vascular resistance. Anaphylaxis, the histamine release can cause you to have hypotension, another important test question that will have a trigger usually, for example, a peanut or bee sting, and then subsequently the respiratory distress, hypotension, GI symptoms, um, and they'll want you to recognize that on the exam. Wrapping up here, we are going to be talking about hypertension. Now, when we think about hypertension, the first most common cause that you'll see in clinical practice as well as on the exam is essential hypertension. This is the hypertension related to a metabolic syndrome stigmata. And the USMLE really wants you to kind of recognize that things such as essential hypertension, obesity, dyslipidemia, hyperglycemia, all of those types of pathologies go together and make up metabolic syndrome. Now, they can test metabolic syndrome as a side effect of, for example, second generation antipsychotics that are D2 antagonists, or they want to kind of give that metabolic syndrome stigmata with like high BMI, et cetera, in your test questions so that you can really capture the essence of coronary artery disease. Hypertension can also be due to too much RAS. Remember, too little RAS cause you to have hypotension. Too much RAS can cause you to have hypertension. What does aldosterone do? It causes you to increase sodium reabsorption, and thus, with that, you get increased water reabsorption, and subsequently, you will get hypertension due to the hypervolemia. Now, nephritic syndromes notoriously on your USMLE are going to have hypertension in the vignette, so watch for that. It is an itis of your kidney, and thus patients are going to have RBC cast, for example, as well as hypertension. And then finally, with hypertension, think about a high sympathetic state or hyperthyroidism. With regards to high sympathetic state, watch out for those ingestion questions. Things like cocaine, PCP, exogenous thyroid hormone, or even things such as pheochromocytoma, those cause you to have a revved up metabolic state and subsequently can have hypertension. All right, so for this lecture, I wanted to really summarize some of the important things we talked about. I made this table that you can now fill out just as a nice active recall guide for you. When we think about temperature, remember hyperthermia, think infectious or inflammatory, hypothermia, think about those patients who can't mount the response. Tachycardia could be due to low oxygen content within the blood, hypovolemia, arrhythmias, important ones for you to recognize, and bradycardia, think about increased vagal tone as well as the ingestions. Hypertension could be due to many causes as we saw. Think about the renin-angiotensin system when you're thinking about both hyper and hypotension, as well as some things such as cardiac etiologies related to hypotension versus ingestions and high sympathetic state related to hypertension. Finally, wrapping up on this table, tachypnea, I always want you to clue in on things like PE, asthma attacks, pneumonia, and then hypoten hy um, excuse me, bradypnea due to any sedatives that's calming your respiratory rate and causing you to have a respiratory acidosis. All right, to wrap this lecture up, let's go back to the test question that we started with and apply some of the mechanisms and some of the strategies that we just learned about. A 50-year-old male presents with chills and fatigue 10 weeks after a cadaveric renal transplant. So that cadaveric renal transplant, that alludes to the fact that he as a host could be immunocompromised. There is no rash, which is a pertinent negative. And then look at the medications he's on, Tacro, steroids, and Bactrim. 
That's a pertinent positive saying that, dang, he is immunocompromised. His vital signs are the following. Again, guys, the point of this lecture, quantitative data to qualitative assessments. He is febrile, he's tachycardic, he's tachypnic, and hypotensive. He's basically in shock. Anytime I see tachycardia and hypotension, I'm thinking about shock. Physical exam is notable for cap refill less than two, warm extremities, and two plus pulses. This is going to allude to warm shock in which he has very bad vasoplegia, and thus he is going to have that physical exam. 48 hours after presentation, his blood culture grows gram-negative bacillus that is oxidase positive. What is this? Bingo. It is Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which is common in patients who are going to be immunocompromised. So what is the likely mechanism related to this patient's acute presentation? The answer here is, remember, gram negatives have endotoxin, and endotoxin is made up of lipopolysaccharide. The most antigenic portion of lipopolysaccharide is going to be lipid A, and that causes you to have a increase in cytokine release that is then going to cause you to have vasodilation and, bam, septic shock. So just to go a step beyond, the morphology of pseudomonas, non-lactose fermenting, oxidase positive, gram-negative bacillus, and here are some other very important test questions related to pseudomonas. Think about it related to nosocomial infections, things like cystic fibrosis, especially chronic colonization, that's important for us to note. Ekthyma gangrenosum, if you Wikipedia, it's this nasty rash that patients with pseudomonas bacteremia or those who are immunocompromised that can get, um, can get it. Febrile neutropenia, these are going to be patients like the transplant patients or, for example, hemonc patients, as well as hot tub folliculitis in which a patient is either on their honeymoon or they are in the hot tub for whatever reason and they have this pustular rash that's going to be on their chest, for example. Think about all of these causes as well as things like otitis externa that can be related to pseudomonal infections. I really hope that this lecture was helpful. And again, the theme that I want to go for here is quantitative data to qualitative assessment. This was a unique lecture in the sense that I really covered important strategies on how to apply content for the USMLE. And I think that that is a niche that I really want to hone in on in our next videos. Most importantly, if you can, for your USMLE questions, I would encourage you to go even one step beyond. So after you got that qualitative assessment of what those vital signs are looking like, then try to correlate that with the physical exam the question gives you. So for example, in this question, we saw that it was shock, and then you noticed that the patient was febrile, so infectious or inflammatory, and bam, you saw that the next line was all about the physical exam being kind of categorizing the patient into warm shock. And so things like norepinephrine, there's an autonomic tie-in that increases alpha-1 mediated agonism. That can be used as one of the pressors for the treatment of septic shock along with fluids. The most important thing that I want to let you know about is this upcoming December, about four weeks from now, right before the holidays, I will be doing a two-day test-taking masterclass. We're going to be going through strategies on how you can be productive as a learner and most importantly, how you can apply various systems to individual question types on the USMLE. This is a very unique opportunity for us to get to know each other, for you to go through kind of like a one-on-one -on -one tutoring type of interaction. And I hope that you take the time to sign up for our early bird special. And uh, this is going to be a really good one. We're going to go through a lot of NBME style questions, dissect it down so that you can start thinking like the test maker. I really hope that this lecture was helpful. I'll see you in future videos. Please comment below some other feedback that you have. And if you haven't already, subscribe. It would mean a lot to me. All right, next video. See you then.